And welcome back to Christian Outdoors Podcast. I'm your host, Pete Rogers. This is episode number 141. If you're just now tuning in to Christian Outdoors Podcast, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening to our show. Please hit the subscribe button. We really appreciate you tuning in and listening. We have surpassed over 330,000 listeners now at Christian Outdoors Podcast. God is doing great things, and we're so thankful for you, the listener, for tuning in each week when we release a new episode here at Christian Outdoors Podcast. If you want to find out more about us, if you just found us and you want to go back into the archives, you can go to ChristianOutdoors.org and you can find every episode there that is archived there for you to listen to. Go all the way back to episode one almost three years ago and you can hear every episode that is being held there at Christian Outdoors at ChristianOutdoors.org. Whew, getting tongue-tied here. But also, th- there's a lot more information on our website. You can get hats like this there at ChristianOutdoors.org. You can also find out more about me. You can donate to the ministry there. And you can also uh, email me directly at Pete at ChristianOutdoors.org. I'm accepting a- invitations now to come speak at your conference or your event for the fall of 22 and the spring of 23. If you or your event planner is looking for someone to come speak, I'd love to come out and help you with that. Just reach out to me, and you can find all that information at ChristianOutdoors.org. Again, this is episode number 141, and we are on YouTube now. This is the second episode that we have posted on YouTube. We're doing the video version of it as well as an audio version. The audio version will still be found on all the podcast platforms, but we can also find a video version now on YouTube at Christian Outdoors Podcast on our YouTube channel. We're just getting started with that, so bear with us as we work out the kinks and kind of get things figured out when it comes to the videoing. It's uh, uh, kind of a new thing. I have a YouTube channel, my personal one, where I do a lot of gun reviews and a lot of uh, uh, training type videos and just informational type things. That's at Pete Rogers uh, Outdoors on YouTube. But on Christian Outdoors Podcast, we're just now getting into videoing these episodes, so please be patient with us while we get it all figured out. Looking forward to doing it this way. We have a new platform that we're recording on, so I can get my guests who are remote. I can still record and and have a good quality episode for you. So be looking out for that. If you prefer to listen to YouTube, we're going to have that covered for you as well. Remember, too, that Christian Outdoors Podcast is a listener-supported podcast. Anything that you can do to help us would be great. You can find out information there again at the website. Thank you for tuning in, and get ready. This week, we have a great episode coming to you here at Christian Outdoors Podcast. This portion of the podcast is being brought to you by Moultrie. Hunters everywhere agree that using game cameras has helped them to survey their animals, gain knowledge of the animals using their property, and has added to the excitement of the hunt. And no other brand in the industry has done more so than Moultrie. Moultrie game cameras have led the way for over 35 years, and today, Moultrie continues to be one of the best-selling brands in the industry, thanks to their innovation, forward-thinking, and real-world testing. Moultrie game cameras are designed by hunters and tested by hunters. Just example, just last spring, I was sent a pair of their newest camera, and I have to tell you, I absolutely love it. The new microcam, it measures a mere two and a half inches by three and a half inches by three and a quarter inches. It fits in the palm of my hand. But don't be fooled, this small camera packs a full 42 megapixels, 80-foot nighttime flash range, and total blackout. Four AAA batteries will last you over 13,000 images. The Moultrie Micro should be your next game camera. You can find out more at MoultriePeters.com. Hey, Chris, welcome back to the show. Thank you for joining me again here at Christian Outdoors Podcast. I have with me again Pastor Chris Taylor from Utica, Kentucky, who's joining me. He's an avid outdoorsman. As you know, we have talked many times on the podcast, and today we're going to be talking about game cameras. We're going to talk about everything that we know about game cameras and then some things that we've read, things that we've researched, things that we have been taught about game cameras. We're going to talk about are they ethical, how to use them, what type of game cameras to use, different methods of using them, and so forth and so forth. But to get started, it's really big in the hunting industry news right now that Utah just joined Arizona in banning the use of trail cameras by hunters. And I'm going to read the press release that Utah sent out, Chris, so that we have it accurate, not just what we think it is. Um, and this is what it says. The Utah legislator passed HB 295 during the 2021 session 
and it went into effect May 5th, 2021. This new, I think that's supposed to be 22. This new law instructed the Utah Wildlife Board to make rules governing the use of trail cameras in hunting. And as a result, the Department of Wildlife conducted two separate surveys that went out to 14,000 big game hunters and requested their feedback. In July of this year, the Wildlife Board voted to prohibit all trail cameras, including both non-handheld transmitting and non-transmitting devices. In the take or to aid in the take of big game between July 31 and December 31 of each year. A trail camera is defined, excuse me, a trail camera is defined as a device that is not held or manually operated by a person and is used to capture images, video, or location data of wildlife and uses heat or motion to trigger the device. This new rule does not apply to government or educational organizations gathering wildlife information, private landowners who are monitoring their property for trespass or active agriculture operations, or to cities involved in urban deer program. However, trail cameras on private property cannot be used to help in the take of big game between July 31 and December 31. And that also applies to public property. So that's the official stance of of Utah as to why they banned the use of trail cameras. Chris, how do you feel about that? <laughs> I, I'm not in Utah, uh, number one. But, uh, I mean, you know, I don't know. I think the first question that comes to my mind is uh, why is it okay for the government, but it's not okay for the private citizen? <clears throat> you know, there's Good a question. specification there, you know. I mean – so long as it's not federal government agencies, I mean, in my opinion, if it's okay for the government to use them as a tool, then it should be okay for the hunter to use them as a tool. Uh, well, let's, uh, let's look at that. I'm going to go back to the language. Uh, we just pulled that back up. Um, it says the government does not apply to the government or edu- it just says or educational for the gathering wildlife information. Or and it doesn't apply to private landowners who are monitoring their property for trespass. So, so using as as a security camera, or to monitor their their wildlife. Yeah, if it's okay for the government in a in a free America, if it's okay mm-hmm. for the government, it should be okay for the private citizen. Hmm. Good point. But Good point. you know, I mean, to take that even further, that I think it even specifies if I re- if I heard you correctly that it is for the monitoring of wildlife. Uh, what else do you use a camera for? I mean, well, we that's use what a it to camera exists for. Yeah, but there, I think their language of to use it in the aid of taking wildlife. I've never okay. had a trail camera kill a deer for me, though. I mean, yeah. Okay. Well, this is the ethical part. Does it help you? in locating deer, patterning deer, monitoring deer, et cetera, or any, you know, cause we use it for turkeys as well. Right. So we're just going right. to say game, you know, for, cause out there, they're talking mostly about elk and mule deer. Um, mostly. And, elk. I, and I think, I mean, I'm not in their context, you know, uh, but in Kentucky, I mean, yeah, you, you get an understanding of the deer that's on your property you get an understanding of maybe some of the routes that they may take at times. Um, You may get a small, I I would say, unless you're running cameras on a huge parcel of land, you're, you're only getting a snapshot of the movements that they make in a day's time. So I wouldn't say you're patterning them, patterning them, but I would say that you may get like a small picture of part of their pattern from time to time yeah i'm gonna dive into that when we get into uh the use of them as far as location and how to set them up and stuff because um i think there's some examples that that could um um, challenge what you just said about that but when it so are gay are the use of game cameras to aid in hunting ethical i mean i go back to the same thing every time i can use um, every bit of common sense that I have when it comes to scent control, when it comes to stand location, when it comes to cameras, 
whether they be cell cam or not. But I am no matter what I'm using, what technology is involved, I'm still hunting a knowledgeable, elusive, wild animal. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's mm-hmm. and and in my context, when it comes to mature bucks, you can try to stack the odds in your favor. But if you're hunting mature bucks, there the odds are always in their favor when right. it comes to their nose right. and right. That's their home territory. Right. I think um, w- one of the things I read when Arizona banned it back in 2018, I think it's going to apply to Utah. And you and I discussed this off camera. And that is that those are very arid, dry states, deserty states, mm-hmm. right? And right. a lot of these game cameras are being used on water sources out there. Mm-hmm. And there's a picture on the Arizona website that has the lone tree over the water hole. And there is a stack of cameras by all these people on that tree. I think I count as eight, eight cameras from the bottom and one on top of another on top of where people are just putting them monitoring the water holes and their cell cameras, which we'll get into that in a minute too. And they're, they're saying that a couple things, it provides an unfair advantage because you know, when the animal's coming to the water, they patterned it three days in a row at 10 o'clock in the morning, this animal's come to the water. And one wildlife officer in Arizona counted 37 game cameras on one water hole. And so there's a couple, I know, I know, but just think it's so dry. All the animals are going to come to the same water hole. Right. And it's going to congregate hunters, going to create an unsafe environment for the hunters. And it's also an unfair advantage for them. So I think, as you said, to put it in their context, it makes a little more sense than it does here in the South. Where, yeah. where we don't have that issue. We don't have really any of those issues that would pertain mm-hmm. to that. <clears throat> As you said, you're hunting more agriculture area. I hunt more big woods here in mm-hmm. South Carolina, and it is very difficult to pattern bucks in big woods, and we'll get yeah. to that in just a minute. But is it ethical? I know guys here in South Carolina that, that just – lambast anybody who uses game cameras saying it's just it's not fair you know what's there already um and and it's just it's just not it's just not fair and then my argument to them is how much technology is too much Hmm. and this just opens a big can of worms doesn't it chris because you could i mean (laughs) if you're going to say that a game camera is not fair then i'm going to say centerfire rifle is not fair Right. right. Or compound yeah. bows. Or, or compound bows. You need to st- arrows. Right. I mean, right. You need you a stone can... tip on wood or bamboo arrow. You know, I mean, uh, and that's just a huge debate. I think make a great show in the future is we talk about some of the technology and that is really pushing the limits and fair chase. And uh, what does that mean? And where is the line? Because I think the line is moving as technology advances. Um, on that line, uh, the professional muskie fishing association just outlawed for their tournaments, um, forward scanning and side scanning sonar because in the muskie world in a tournament, two fish can win it. And some anglers who had this $20,000 technology showed up with 15 fish and beat second place by 14 fish. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that's just all right. All right. We got to we got to go think about this. So that's an example of how technology is changing it and how far is too far. Um, but let's get back to game cameras. So. So the so the ethics of it. I mean, I, I can only speak for my context, but the way I use trail cameras, I believe is 100 percent ethical. I mean, okay. a, tr- a trail camera. My trail cameras have never helped me in the actual harvest of a mature buck. It gave me an idea of what was on the properties that I was hunting. Um, But even in the way that I use trail cameras, it didn't really ever set me up for what I would call a kill hunt. Mm -hmm. You know, they, Mm -hmm. they, I understood where the bucks or that I understood what bucks were on my property but that the rest of it was woodsmanship and scouting and you know all of that stuff that right. put me in the right position right you know, to right. be able to harvest right. So, right well i can't i can't say that now 
you're speaking of bucks. I'm going to speak of animals because I have wild pigs on my property. Right. And, mm-hmm. and as I said before, I love to hunt wild pigs. And mm-hmm. I had, this was before cell cameras. We're going to talk about cell cameras separately. This is just regular game cameras. And I went, I went down to my property. I pulled my game card. I came out or my SD card. And I looked at it and I said, well, four nights in a row at six 30 in the evening, this group of six pigs is coming out. Mm-hmm. So I went to my stand with my bow and sat up. I got there about five 30 and sure enough at six 15, I could see him coming, you know, cause I had corn out for the, you know, for the, for the animal, which is legal here in South Carolina. And here they came, they came right by my stand at 15 yards and I stuck one of them and it was freaking awesome. Mm-hmm. Okay. That, <laughs> that camera knowledge, a, let me know that there were pigs there. Cause I didn't know that we had pigs at this location. Let me know that there were pigs there. Let me know what time they were coming out and it set it up perfectly for me. Now that's right. pigs, right? But I think, and that's why I'm saying gear cameras and not deer cameras because we use them for all animals at least. Uh, right. Um, and so in that case, it helped me to pattern these animals and to be able to take one of them legally and successfully because I knew or for three days in a row, they had done the same thing. So I assumed they were going to do it for the fourth day. Right. Mm-hmm. And they did. And it worked out great. Um, so I think that has happened to me once with deer. Uh, and it wasn't mature deer. I was looking to shoot does right with mm-hmm. again, w- again, with my bow. And I had this funnel, uh, that I had a camera on just to, I had it set up initially just to survey what was coming through there. And I had this group of four does that were coming by every evening at the exact same time. Well, I had to stand there. So I sat in it and here they came at the exact same time. There was no food or anything. It was just a, uh, a travel corridor and I was able to take one of them. Did that provide, provide an unfair advantage? Yeah, probably because I, I had them patterned. I, I knew for so many days in a row these deer or these animals were coming on this path at the same time, virtually within 15 minutes of it every day. So right. yeah, that helped again, that's taking animals. And I think it's a, as we've said before in other podcasts, Chris, it's different if you're talking about mature bucks. Mm-hmm. It just and is. It, and, it, and in my context, I mean, I use trail, I put trail cameras out in July. Uh, usually with corn because it's legal in Kentucky and it's really just a survey tool. It gives me an idea of who's left, who's alive, mm-hmm. who's running around, what kind of growth they're having for the summer. And right. then I'll, I'll run on my switch on at some point mid October to scrapes. And really that's the same thing. It's just to get an idea of who's hitting what and what area they're at. And, okay. and then, and then, uh, they stay on scrapes until February and then well, they come out of the woods. Yeah. You let's know? talk about doing the survey. Cause that's something I did for years. Then I had to stop because of a variety of things. Um, but Dr. Grant Woods talks about methods of surveying your property to get pictures of the deer on your property. And one of the things that, that he talks about is not just counting bucks, but also counting fawns so that you know what your recruitment rate is. And that's something that's very important. I was actually right. doing that over the weekend from the cameras I pulled last weekend or earlier this week of seeing how many fawns were showing up. So the way that I do it, and I'm not saying I'm doing it correctly, but I just followed what, Dr. Wood said, or something similar that I adapted to my property is on this 300 acre piece of property. I divided it into 75 acre parcels on a map. Mm-hmm. All right. And I put a camera in the center of that 75 acre parcel and I dump a hundred pounds of corn about 20 feet in front of the camera. Mm-hmm. You know, I found if you sidebar, if you get the camera too close or too far, and I have found in this situation, 20 feet to 25 feet is about perfect. Mm-hmm. You know, it gives a wide enough area and you get close enough up so that you can actually start telling the differences in the different animals, even the does. Um, so I put a camera about 25 feet away and every in, in a 75 yard block. And it gives me an idea of how many deer are on the property, number one, does, fawns, and bucks. And I count them and I, and I separate them by that. How many does, how many right. fawns, how many bucks. And yeah, you get some overlap, especially on the does and fawns. They're a lot harder to tell apart. Um, 
but but it lets me know and then what i do from there is i say okay based on how many deer are showing up on the survey this is what we will take off the property this year this many bucks this many does and some years it's two bucks i don't care who kills it if i kill both of them then you're out of luck chris but mm -hmm. if you kill both of them i'm out of luck right right but i if i kill one you kill. but it's but we're basing our our take of animals on how many deer are on the property right not not on what the rules and regulations say is legal and that has really served us well through the years by doing that so every 75 and i will run those for two weeks that's what dr mm -hmm. would suggest run them for 14 days or until all the corn is gone or i can get back and get to the cameras then i'll pull all those cameras and i go through the sd cards and i do my survey then i take my cameras and put them in my more hunting I know, I'm, I'm air quoting i hate air quoting but in more <laughs> hunting type situations or locations on trails pinch points things of that nature to to see how the deer are moving across the landscape that's how i use them to survey how do you use them to survey same kind of way but i mean my main most of the time my main focus is to figure out what bucks are alive i mean we live in i mean I, you could technically call us the midwest you know we're i'm in western kentucky um so we're looking for certain bucks that we know made it through last year we're looking at their improvement their growth uh we're looking at mature deer what deer are mature what deer are not what uh, you know what deer should be harvested what deer should be left for another year um and then the doe when it comes to does and fawns and stuff like that we don't really worry about that in our area uh because i mean they're just healthy there's healthy herds i mean and if there's one farm i hunt if i were to if i were to take the does i'd have to have help by the landowner who allows me the great is gracious enough to allow me to hunt he would have to get me some tags because there, there's just a astronomical amount of those on this property is that where yeah. we were last year when you shot the big yeah, buck? that's that's where you were with me that yeah. was a lot of does that came out yeah it, i think we had like 17 or 18 does at one time just standing right in front of us at 50 yards yeah uh, <laughs> Yeah. That's a lot of deer. <laughs> and that's not abnormal. You know, that's yeah. just about yeah. every time you go. Um, yeah. Now I'll usually take two or three out. I'm allowed two does and a buck on my uh, original uh, license that I buy with my uh, yearly thing. And then I'm allowed a couple of bonus tags and I'll try to feel, uh, you know, those two tags, those two doe tags usually on that property because the does need to be taken off more mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. than anywhere. Mm -hmm. but uh my my surveying has more to do with bucks and mature bucks than it does really anything else i don't worry about recruitment rate i don't worry about uh doe uh to, to buck ratio because it, it's we got more does than we do bucks it's yeah. just here you know yeah yeah Our population is not struggling in kentucky at all um, yeah, and your bag so, limits are a lot less than ours, right? right? So that makes a difference. See, I can kill legally. I have three buck tags and seven doe tags. Wow. Okay, <laughs> I can buy a bonus buck tag if I want to, but that's enough, right? For where yeah, I'm but like, so, but like three of your does is equivalent to one of ours. So. <laughs> yes, yes, our does are. I mean, our deer are small. I mean, a full grown mature doe is going to weigh. You know, full body, 100, 110 pounds. Yeah, yeah. They, you body. were with me. You were just watering. Your mouth was watering over the size of them does. <laughs> Let me see one. That. Let me see one. In, <laughs> in that video that you took, you're like, man, that's a big doe. Let me kill him. Let me kill her. <laughs> no, no, we couldn't do that. I had to wait on the buck to come out. You can't eat those horns, though. We, did, we, did, we didn't know he was coming. That's true. Well, until that's we true. knew. Until yeah well we, we but we were just uh it's one of those things they came out so early that yeah. we're just gonna wait wait till closer till dark to see if anything that you know if, if if a good buck comes out so and i do that at home too if uh you know if a doe comes out at 4 30 i'm gonna be like i got three hours till dark i'm gonna wait and see if something else comes out right but if she's still there at 7 30 gets dark at eight she's going into freezer yeah you know because yeah. i got uh like i said i got 
I can kill seven deer total. I think mm -hmm. I, my tags came in the mail yesterday and I hadn't actually, I have not opened them because I always buy bonus doe tags. Mm -hmm. And so I can't remember how many come with my license. I know I buy four and I can't remember if it's three or if it's four or two that come with my license. So, mm -hmm. um, that way, um, uh, I'm legal. I can fill my freezer and not worry about being over the limit. Right. Okay. So that's how you survey. You're you're looking for specific bucks on your property that yeah. he gives these sillies names to, so he can tell yeah. them apart. But I mean, if um, you go back to previous shows, I mean, we've had conversations. Yeah, you know, about we we name our yeah. deer. Everybody's yeah, got names, but yeah, Chad and I talked about naming some of those bucks. I sent you the pictures the other day. So we came up with Jeff and uh, Greg, <laughs> Steve, and I think the other one was uh, uh, Barry. I don't know where Barry came from. I'm checking up with Barry. So we got Jeff, Steve, Greg, and Barry. That's the four bucks that we're looking at right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we got a passel of pigs on the property too. I cannot, of course we can shoot pigs year round. Right. Yeah. But, but it's just too daggum hot right now. I mean, they will be, they will be spoiled before you get the hide off of them. Um, all right. Back, back to cell cameras. So that's how you use them to survey. And then you said you put them on a scrape. See, I have never put a camera on a scrape. So why do you put them on a scrape? Because that's where your bucks end up mid, mid October here. You know, okay. um, I mean, here, you, if you don't switch to scrapes, you, you start thinking, well, where do bucks go? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. um, the reality is, is that that time of the year, that pre, pre, I mean, they use all kinds of different names at that pre rut time, yeah, you know, yeah. they're laying scrapes, they're checking scrapes, they're sit checking does and, you know, right. really just to kind of get an idea of when these does are going to cycle, you know? Yeah. So, so let so me I ask you about that. Scrapes. All right. So we're going to, we're going to merge a little bit of scrape knowledge in with this game camera because I'm someone who, we don't get a lot of scrapes on the properties I hunt. There, there are a few. You'll find some here and there. But, okay, so are these natural scrapes or mock scrapes? And have you ever done mock scrapes and put cameras on them? Because I'm going to try that this year. I'm yes, going to try these, doing a mock scrape and put a camera on it. So go ahead. These are, these are natural and mock. Uh, okay. They're both. Okay. Um, in, in our area, and, and everything I speak from is, of course, just from my sure. context. But, and me too. But me too. Yeah. In, in our area, you know, scrapes are a communal sort of gathering area that both does and bucks use. And a lot of times you will find if you know your woods and you scout and you, you're there enough, you will find what I would call annual scrapes. You know, yeah. these are your same spot every yep. every year, same spot, different bucks. You know, uh, yeah. And so these places that I hunt and the, these uh, areas that I'm thankfully able to hunt, I've hunted them long enough that I've learned about these communal areas and I've learned about these communal scrapes and these annual scrapes. And so a lot of times I'll just switch. I know exactly where I'm going. You know, okay. I'll, I'll grab my camera and t take it straight to that spot, knowing that even if there isn't a scrape there right now, it's getting ready to be. Yeah. Um, so do then, you like, so if there's not a scrape there, excuse me for interrupting you, do you like make it a scrape? Do you scratch out all the dirt and everything so that it will kind of get them started? I'm telling, I'm telling my secrets. And of course, everybody's got different opinions, but well, you I'll don't have to share. Usually, yeah. I'll, I'll that's what usually, I would do. But between 10 to 15 yards away, I will go to, to another spot that I think a deer could use as a scrape. I will clean that spot out with my boot. Uh, and I, then I will take a stick and I will turn the, the soil up. And then I will <laughs> I'll pee in the scrape. Uh, and I've done that for years. I mean, uh, and, yeah. and, the, and the, there's many times there's two or three scrapes that I know of now that are annual scrapes and I don't even have to touch them. And I started them eight years ago. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. so, uh, Chris's deer lure. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> I've peed, you know, I have, I have peed or urinated in scrapes for decades. Yeah. And I, and the way I found that out sidebar here, we'll get back to game cameras in a minute was this property I was hunting had a lot of scrapes on it. And I was trying to, 
keep the deer from using this scrape to focus on the scrape closer to where my stand was. So I thought if I urinated in it, it would repel them and make them use the other one. Oh, it had the exact opposite effect. The scrape got three times as large, deep, deep in the ground. I had to move my stand, you know, Mm -hmm. and that's how I learned it just by, just by happenstance back then. Um, all right, back to game cameras. So when you do this scrape, either mock or natural, how far away do you put your camera? Sometimes on the tree the scrape's on. That close. I always, I always switch my cameras to video when I put them on a scrape. Okay. So, so anytime that I move my camera from what I would call a survey position, which is usually corn on a field edge, you know, just to get an idea of what's around, or if it's sure. at, 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 at our place, you know, it's all big woods. So we have a couple of food plots and we use those food plots and then funnels. We'll take a, uh, an area we know that deer are funneling through and we'll put corn down. But either way, when I move them from that communal survey type position, I'll move them to a scrape. I'll switch them to video and mm-hmm. I'll find a tree, either the tree that scrapes on itself or a tree that's about 10 yards away okay. yeah, and, and, and face it on the scrape, always on video and, and then turn it on. Because the, the truth is you're not going to get near as many pictures or videos on a scrape as you do on a communal type uh, survey type position because uh, you know, you're, you're main, you're getting natural movement. At right, this point, right. Right. You know? Right. So, right. 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 And you don't have a group of four does that's going to stand and eat corn for 45 minutes. Yeah. So. Just blow your camera up. I know. Yeah. I know. Um, so the video, do you do like a 10 second, 15, 30 second video? I'm just curious. I usually, I usually just take little 10 second videos. Cause that's I mean, what I it, do as it, well. Yeah. It grabs, it grabs the, the deer as it's coming in and then you get to see it mess with the scrape and kind of how they interact with the scrape. Yeah. You know, and then, and then it shuts off. Right. So, right. I do 10 second video with like a three minute gap between them or something like that. Mm-hmm. Depends on the brand of the camera gives you the different options on how to set those up. This portion of the podcast is being brought to you by the 45 caliber CVA Paramount HTR. The Paramount HTR is designed to handle super magnum propellant charges of up to 170 grains by volume or 119 grains by weight of the Blackhorn 209 powder, enabling the Paramount HTR to provide muzzle velocities comparable to centerfire rifles. If you pair it with the Powerbelt 285 grain 45 caliber bullet, which were specifically designed for the Paramount, the HTR can produce muzzle velocities previously thought unattainable for a muzzle loader, such as 2,475 feet per second into 45 caliber, which are comparable to velocities of a 308 centerfire rifle. But speed's worth nothing without the accuracy to put those shots where they belong, and this is where the nitride-treated stainless steel Vergara barrel sub-MOA groups are easily obtainable. The original Paramount, the HTR, has a hunting-oriented stock design and is dipped in the new Realtree hillside camo pattern for excellent concealment capability in variety of terrains. The Paramount HTR provides serious muzzleloader hunters with the most long-range capable hunting muzzleloader ever developed. You can find out more at cva.com. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Um, okay, so you go from the survey to scrapes, and the, and, and that's the only place you put them in hunting that's season it. On, on scrapes. Yeah. Okay. After, by, at February, a lot of times during what I call shed season, it's not really a season, but I do a lot of shed hunting with my dog. And, and so during that time of year, I'll carry a backpack and, and, I'll, and grab, I'll yeah. grab my cameras as I walk through the woods. So. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that's, yeah. that's usually March. You know, yeah. I used to, to that, I but. used to leave my cameras out year round and, and just say, I'm just wasting batteries and SD cards and, you know, um, mm-hmm. I will, I will move them more to security locations, you know, watch my gates in my cabin and things like that, mm-hmm. um, during that time of year. And, uh, uh, but other than that, I pull them out of the woods and I've also seen the cameras last longer if you take them out and don't mm-hmm. leave them out there year round. They cause yeah. 
the seals wear out, they start to grab water and they start to break down just from being in the elements, right? Mm -hmm. I don't care how good you build them. If you leave them out there 365, they're not going to last as long. But if you pull them at the end of your season and, uh, you know, kind of clean them up a little bit, take the batteries out so the batteries don't start to corrode in the housing and things of that nature, then you can get four or five years out of them. Hey, I got, I got, I got a handful of cameras on seven, eight, nine years. I, I do so. too. I do too. Uh, actually there's two that I'm still using. I'm not going to say the brand cause, uh, I, I just don't want to, um, that I found, I say I'm using, I found two that I bought. This is 2022. It seems like it was in 13 or 14. I mm -hmm. found them in a cabin. I was cleaning out. I said, I wonder if these still work. I put batteries in and poof, turned right on. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but well, they're Moultrie cameras. I can say that cause Moultrie is helping sponsor this particular podcast. Uh, and, and some of the best cameras made, I mean, Moultrie makes really, really good cameras and, uh, it's, uh, um, yeah, I, I was just shocked that they turned on. Now I haven't put them in the field yet. Right. But, they turned on and I was able to cycle through and program it and set the date and time. It was funny because it came on as a 2013, 2014, 2015. No, no, well, keep going, keep going. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Um, okay. All right. So you put them, how high on the tree do you put them? I uh, usually about waist right okay. at weight. For, for me, that's uh, uh, 35 inches. Yeah. Three and a half inches. <laughs> Three and a half, I mean, 33 and a half, 35 and a half inches. <clears throat> um, so three feet or so off the ground. Cause that's something that, that I struggle with is because we get a lot of grass broom straw that'll start setting the camera off. So mm -hmm. I've actually gone up higher and angled them down some and, or I have to go and continually weed eat in front of the camera to keep the grass from setting it off, uh, and blowing limbs and things of that nature, uh, which, all right. So let's get into some tips and some mistakes in using cell cam or game cameras. Then we're going to get into cell cameras. Mistake one is uh, you point it towards the rising or setting sun. Mm -hmm. Do not point your camera east or west. Get your compass out. Find a tree. Get the angle so that it's not facing a rising or setting sun because you will get nothing. I mean, just, yeah. yeah. It'll be blurred in the morning and foggy. Yeah. and Yeah. 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 It will, it will. And that's the, that comes from learning that, uh, all right, you go mistake. Number two. Uh, I would say wasting uh, a few weeks in an area that, uh, you really haven't scouted by just throwing a camera up and hoping something happens. You know, yep. I, I, yep. I think there's wasted camera spots. Yes, you know? absolutely. But sometimes that's how you learn that, that, that that's a wasted area though. Yeah, right. you, you agree with that? I would say also using cheap batteries. Mm -hmm. Don't go to Dollar General and buy batteries. Sorry, Dollar General, but those are not quality batteries, right? Well, well DG DG sells copper top Duracells. They do. I was talking about the Dollar General brand. Right, right. I'm talking about the Dollar right. General brand. Um, actually, I now I use lithium batteries. Okay, but I've had You're really, bougie. uh, huh. Yeah, you're you're a bougie camera user. Yeah, well, I can't afford them lithium batteries and all. But they last. I use. They last all season. Yeah, I never have they to change. Usually them. do. Then I never have to change them. The negative of a of a lithium battery is it won't tell you the battery is getting weaker. It just dead. It's just dead. It goes right. for the little bar on your thing that says full battery, and then the next thing it just doesn't take a picture. Um, right. But I tell you, I've had really good luck with the Amazon brand batteries. I don't know who makes them, but a friend of mine said, man, these are some really great prices. And I bought a pack of a hundred double A's for like 20 bucks. Right. Mm -hmm. And they lasted almost the entire season, uh, yeah. about, about three years ago. So those are really good. I've, used, I've yeah. used them too. They're pretty yeah, good. They are. They are. But, uh, so I I'd say is, uh, um, don't point towards the sun. Don't, don't use cheap batteries. Uh, take it out of the season, take it out of the woods when it's, when you're not using it. I think another mistake is, um, that's why I you ask don't. you how high, how high, either too high or too low. And you're it's not right. angled, angled correctly. Uh, some of the more, some of the gooder, gooder, 
How about that grammar? Some of the better cameras <laughs> now let you see where it's, where it's aiming, right? Mm -hmm. But I will put it on a tree, and I like to go about belly button high on me. I'm six foot, so that's still about three feet off the ground. Um, but sometimes I have to go higher because, like I said, there's debris or whatever in the way. But uh, but then I will walk over to where I want the camera to take a picture. I'll look at it. Oh, it's angled too far left. Go back mm -hmm. and move it and, and adjust it. And something else I started doing, and I got this tip on YouTube of a guy who puts cameras on public land to keep from being stolen. What's the first thing you notice when you see a camera in the woods? For me, it's the strap. I Usually, see a black. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, take the strap off and replace it with paracord. Mm -hmm. You don't see the paracord. Plus, I can get it a lot tighter and I can maneuver it on the tree a little bit better. And I can make mm -hmm. it as long as I want to. So I can be around a big fat tree or I can be around a little skinny tree. So I've replaced a lot of my factory straps. I don't even put them on. I just go straight to green paracord and I mm -hmm. do a loop knot on one end, go around the tree, thread it through the, the loop, pull it as tight as I want to and tie it off. Uh, that's a really good, and especially if you're putting the cameras on public land, as I'm telling you, the first thing I see is the strap. Mm -hmm. Cause you can see the star strap from 365 degrees. You only see the camera from one degree. You know, maybe uh, you, you may go 15 degrees either side, but but you're going to see that strap. And if you want to hide it, use paracord. Um, I'd buy I'd buy a camera company that allows you the option to format the SD card on the camera. So yes. There's been so many times I've got back to the camera. There's no pictures, and it has to do with the formatting of the SD card. And there's yes. a lot of camera co camera companies out there that's learned you know, they need to include that as a feature. Yes. You know, so there's yes. a lot of camera companies you can get where you can format on the car camera itself. Yes. Yes, you can. And to that, I mentioned Moultrie before, but these new Moultrie micro cameras, I don't know if you've seen them. They're not, they're just a regular game camera. They're three inches by three inches by two inches. The huh. micro cam 42 megapixel. Okay. Really? 80 foot flash range at night. Mm -hmm. All right, and it's total blackout. They are awesome. Well, I'm in the field setting it up, and I put my SD card in there, blah, 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 and I cannot get it to work. It's a brand-new camera. So I call the number inside. You know, you, you open the door. There's a for help, scan this code, blah, blah, blah. And I called the lady. Yeah, very, for helpful, old guys. <laughs> very helpful. Very <laughs> helpful. I said, I cannot get this thing to work. And she said, what kind of card are you using? I told her, and, 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 and she said, put it in and do this and, and she says scroll through menu it says format hit that boom formatted yeah. the card i didn't have a problem um mm -hmm. but i mean i'm taking ownership of that because i did not know how to format it i never had a camera that did that right but i also want to give a shout out to the customer service that walked me right through it i got a human who spoke english that walked me through the process um, mm -hmm. but those are really good cameras, Chris. If you're looking for some cameras that, that are not cell cameras, just a regular camera, they're like $84 a piece. Um, mm -hmm. so, and you can get a two pack at, at, in a, you get a two pack package if you want to, but it's just, it's the, the Moultrie mini micro or micro mini. Uh, like I said, it's, it's about the size of a tape measure of, huh. you know, yeah. It's really cool. It's crazy. 40, 42 megapixel. Uh, and I like it for a lot of reasons. One is that it's not obvious. You put the paracord on it, you can hide that son of a gun. You know, you can hide it. Yeah, um, yeah it could disappear pretty easily. It really can. It really can. Um, all right. So the height, uh, what's another thing that a mistake that people make in using in using game cameras? Not knowing was, how to use your camera when you put it out. That, that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Set them I mean, up. I'm not going to call any names or anything, but the host of the show, get, the host get of the to show. know your camera a little bit before you go take it to the woods. I literally opened the package in the woods. <laughs> That's what I did, and of course the uh, the the uh, uh, what do you call the instruction book. They make them so small, size one font. Even my 2.0 readers, I couldn't see the words. Yeah. I don't know why they they have decided to make the. I want giant font user manuals. 
for all you had to equipment. you had to have somebody in the next county hold it for you so you could read it right yeah either that or electron <laughs> microscope you know <laughs> use a micro micro print data on these user manuals <clears throat> excuse me um let's talk cell cameras all right so for the listener who doesn't know a cell camera is the camera has a modem in it that transmits the picture to an app that you download mm -hmm. on your smartphone and you can get the pictures in real time. Mm -hmm. Okay. That is a cell camera. All right. A couple of negatives about cell cameras for Pete. I have a hard time getting signal where I live. Mm -hmm. I bought four cell cameras three years ago for a specific piece of property. Never got the first picture because I couldn't get a signal. I tried mm -hmm. the, uh, the antenna on the, uh, booster arm goes up the tree. Yeah. No signal, no signal, no signals, then no signal. Another negative of cell. So make sure you have a signal. Um, like the Moultrie cameras have Verizon AT&T. Uh, so if you have Verizon on your cell phone, go to where you want to put it, make sure you have a signal before you buy the camera. Cause if you don't have a signal on your phone, the camera's not going to get a signal. Right. All right. Um, the monthly plans can be expensive depending on the brand. Mm -hmm. They can. Um, and what I have found with cell cameras is they're not, they don't tend to be as durable as a non cell camera. It's because of, there's a lot going on in it. Yeah. Right? A lot of electronics. Um, and you can set them up to send pictures once a day or twice a day or real time. And it's going to, use your batteries up faster if you have it send every time you get mm -hmm. as opposed to if you have them send once or twice or three times a day because where the battery usage is is in sending the signal out mm -hmm. you definitely need lithium batteries in the cell camera i mean with technology comes technicality you know you they're, they're more technical you know so yeah. you got to be familiar with them you got to know how to work you got to know how to format, how to set them up, you know. Uh, now, most of them are streamlined enough that it's pretty simple. It know, is, and you can do it, and usually you can do it with the app. You can use the app on your phone to mm -hmm. go and, and, and adjust the settings, which which is what I do with mine is uh, when I first put, when I did my survey, I had it sending pictures a lot, and now that I'm not doing that, I backed it down to twice a day I get the pictures. Mm -hmm. and then just boom you get 20 pictures at one time and that's that's me i mean most of the time it sends it to me i think i've got it set up to where it sends it to me at 10 a.m and 10 p.m yeah, there you so, go i'm in uh, bed so at 10 p.m so i get morning movement and then evening movement yeah yeah so yeah um i think as far as how to use a cell camera other than get a signal you use it just like a non-cell camera yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, exactly I, have, the same. I have five cell cameras and all, every one of them is used the exact same way that I just described. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Are they all the same brand? No. Uh, yeah. They're mine aren't two either. different brands. Yeah. Um, they will soon be the same brand. Uh, yeah. I've yeah. been rather frustrated with yeah. a certain brand. But... Yeah. Me as well. And I don't, I don't use them anymore. Um, and I have ordered the Moultrie mobile is what it's called. The Moultrie mobile. Mm -hmm. I have not gotten it yet. Um, so I'm, I'm anxious to, 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 to try it, but the, uh, mm -hmm. but some of the other ones are really good. I would just say, check the reviews before you buy one. Um, uh, mm -hmm. but I would, now I have had difficulty on all brands of cell cameras, getting the video to work. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know if it's that, uh, what one person said is, you need a certain type of SD card mm -hmm. for it to work. It's like a series all, 10. It's like a series 10 or class something. 10. Yeah. yeah, class 10. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I just put the one that came in it because it came with an SD card. So I just used that one. But I've, uh, and it may be the app. I'm trying to use the app to switch it to video. And I may, I may need to do that on the camera itself. Um, because that is a button push on the, or, or a slide switch on the camera to go from photo to video. Um, up until I will say up until this year, 
I'm, I'm going to try the cell cameras this year on the scrapes. So up until this year, the cell cameras were just used for monitoring at, you know, spots that I put corn out because I had so many frustrating encounters with technology issues. And um, so, so I just put my trusty old cell cams that don't have, or my trusty old trail cams that don't have cell capabilities up on, on my scrapes and turn the video. And then I'd go check to check the camera every week yeah. or two, you know, yeah. but yeah. Yep. Um, all right. So we talked about location. We talked about surveying, patterning, movement, and things of that nature. I'm just still fascinated that you just go straight to scrapes. Um, cause that's something that I just, I don't think I've ever put one on a scrape. I tend to go more towards funnels, bottlenecks, uh, corridors where they're moving. Oh, that's the lesson on, on, uh, how to use a camera, make sure that it's looking up and down the trail, not across mm -hmm. the trail. That was the mistake I made because they walk in front of it and all you get is pictures of a, butt. in there, you right. know, by the time it triggers. So have it looking down the trail, uh, uh you know, in the same direction, the trail's going as opposed to perpendicular to the trail. Uh, and I have, I have, uh, I'd say most of mine, when I move them off my feeders, which I have some that stay on the feeders cause I have the timed feeders cause my property is mm -hmm. three hours away. So we fill those up and they run twice a day. They, you know, for about seven seconds, put a little bit of corn out so we can see what's there and it keeps the pigs coming. And as mm -hmm. I said, I like to kill pigs. So, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I really do. I would rather shoot pigs than, it had to be then I would deer a lot of the times, unless it's a. Oh, a man. We're not talking about trophy bucks now. We're not talking oh, about. Man. We're not talking about big trophy bucks, all right? That's always a different category. But as far as just regular deer, man, those pigs are fun. Nobody shames you for killing a three-year-old pig, <laughs> <laughs> or a two-year-old pig, or a hundred-pound yeah, pig. True. Nobody shames you for that. You don't have to worry if you blow the hunt. Oh, I'll never see that buck again. That pig will come back. <laughs> yeah, you can get them next time uh so it's just to me it it's it's fun because there's not as much pressure yeah you know and, and i and i enjoy that i enjoy mostly stalking them you know, slipping through the woods sneaking up on them that's the that's the part i enjoy the most that's one of the small reasons why i prefer turkeys but yeah you yeah. know it's just not yeah. a whole lot of not near as much pressure you know yeah yeah there's always another long beard that's right that's right. We need to do a whole show on, on, on hunting pigs. We'll have to talk about that. All right. Is there anything else on game camera? Cause I feel like I'm rambling a little bit, Chris. I feel like I'm forgetting something. I, I would just say, uh, use them in the way that you feel are ethic, ethically uh, best for your herd, uh, for the animal that you're hunting. Um, and treat what you do with respect you know you're mm -hmm. it's a it's a, a freedom that we get to enjoy and uh we get to fill our freezers with food and uh, about as organic as food comes oh yeah um, yeah and had deer steaks you, two nights ago use the tools that you have in your tool belt uh to the best of your ability to to enjoy mm -hmm. it and and mm -hmm. have fun while you do it yeah, absolutely. And I'd say this too, it is a learning curve. I mean, what Chris and I have learned through the years of using them, we've tried to share, we are by no means experts in game camera usage, but, no. and obviously our approaches are a little different. So hopefully the listener can find something in here and say, well, I'm going to try that, or I want to try this, or I never thought about that. Hopefully it will. Um, but there's always things to use. Now, the reason I like it, for is a, a couple of things besides seeing what's there to me it adds to the hunt it's it, it's another piece of the puzzle of participating in the outdoors you know i have I like mean, a because pre-season it's like camera season you know you talked about shed season right. this is cameras i put mine out in july also usually around the middle of july i'll go put them out and do my survey the phones should be born and they should be you know moving around a good bit by then and so i'll do my I, I put them out in july and i'm like i can't wait to see what's here this year i can't wait to see what's here this year you know and i sent chris a picture of uh, one of my feeders i got seven different bucks coming to that feeder twice a day every day 
Uh, now I know when the batch of groups break up, we may see one or two more of those during right. during the hunting season. But it's still really exciting and cool to see that, to sure. see that there's seven different bucks coming to this one spot. Uh, and that's, and that's really, really exciting for me to be able to see that. And that adds to the excitement of opening day coming. Yeah. It really does. Yeah, I mean, it gets you ready. It knows what you're, uh, it prepares you for what's coming. You know? Right. And right. I enjoy, I enjoy checking cameras and running cameras and all that good stuff just as much as I do hunting, you know, it's, absolutely it's, to me, it's a part of the process. Me too. But, me too uh, and our actually archery season opens monday here on my property down there it's supposed to be like 97 degrees i'm like that's crazy you open in august yeah both season opens august 15th on my property and on the joining county gun season opens august 15th that's yeah, usually the, so we don't that's usually we, we, the dog hunters yeah well our gun season opens september 1 and it goes that's until a, January and it goes until January one. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, every state, we got I mean, archery, we got archery only till October and then we get to use a muzzleloader for three days and then, then yeah. it opens up to archery again and then rifle in November. But. Yeah. Well, I'm sure different parts of Kentucky are a little bit different also, just like here, different parts of the state are a little bit different. No, uh, that's the whole state. Is it really? Wow. Yeah, whole state. Well, it's, it's well, we have four different game zones, and and two of the zones gun season opens August fifteenth, and goes all the way to January first, and then game zone, what's my zone three, uh, archery opens August fifteenth and gun September first, and then game zone one and two. Let's see, archery comes in September fifteenth muzzleloader october one it's only it's the only zone that has a separate muzzleloader season october That's one crazy. to the 10th and then rifle season opens o october 11th in oh. zone in zones one and two which are the what we call the upstate the mid the mid, middle of the state up towards the mountains uh and each zone has different uh take requirements or take laws so even though I told you I have three buck tags and seven doe tags, whatever it is, that depends on which zone I'm hunting in. Mm -hmm. Okay. But for the zone I hunt in the most, that's it. But like, I, like in where I live, zone one, the mountains, I can only take two does. No matter how many tags I have, I can only take two does and I think two bucks. So it, they're, they're, those doe tags are zone specific. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anyway you. yeah well but like you said it takes three does to fill to make a meal <laughs> true <laughs> chris true. An another great conversation here i really appreciate you joining me again here at chris outdoors podcast or do you have any closing comments not really all right have a good hunt yeah, it's that's what I soon. say. Season is right around the corner, guys and gals out there. I know you're getting excited. Get your gun sighted in. Get your bow sighted in. If you're a bow hunter, get out there and practice. Get your muscles built up. Get your confidence. If you're a gun hunter, don't skip the range. Don't assume your gun is still zeroed in from last year. Take it to the range. Shoot it. Get comfortable with it. Know how it performs so that when the opportunity comes, you, you know what your gun is going to do and how it's going to perform. Thanks again for listening to Christian Outdoors Podcast. I'm your host, Pete Rogers, here with Chris Taylor, and we hope you have a blessed day.